have a very special person to introduce our very special guest speaker. Uh, you guys mostly know Charity Jensen, who is our 360 Missions Director, and uh, she's going to come at this time and introduce someone who is uh, near and dear to her heart, and uh, we are going to present to you our 2014 Missions Act. Charity, let's give her a big hand. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's really good to be here this morning. Um, so this morning, we'll be hosting my mom, Jennifer. Um, seven years ago, she started a nonprofit organization that works in India, Nepal, and Myanmar today. Um, yeah, and we've chosen Global Families to be our 2014 missions focus, which means that throughout the next year, we'll be holding various events to raise money for them, as well as keeping you guys updated on uh, what they're doing and all the ways that we're helping them. So. Um, yeah, I'd like to welcome my mom. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Before she, might, she comes up, we're gonna show a video. Um, Hannah, could you play that? No one wants their little girl to be in danger. Yet millions of young girls are at risk of trafficking systematic abuse every day. At the heart of the Daughter Project is the belief that each of these girls is as precious to God as our own daughter. Tragically, many girls around the world are untouched, taken, and lured away. So we have shelters ready to take them in. Our shelter home in New Delhi, India is a safe place where girls rescued by the police are brought to be cared for and counseled while their legal proceedings are resolved so they can be released to go home. Our qualified team work around the clock to receive the girls, get them the medical attention they need, go to court to fight on their behalf, and help locate their families. <laughs> the quality of care and efficiency of this shelter have proven results. In a year and a half, over 100 girls have been rescued. Global Family has become a renowned shelter for girls trafficked in domestic labor and sex slavery as in the case of one girl who was sold into slavery by her unsuspecting mother. They used to beat her up, they used to strike her clothes, at times they used to make her stand naked, they used to beat her with brooms. She had to do all kinds of work, washing, cleaning, mopping, working as a nanny, taking care of all the children. So I just told her that there is someone who loves you, and you don't ever feel scared. And if at all there is something, you can share it. But she was scared, she didn't want to say anything. And the next day when I came in, she suddenly came in the room. She caught my hand and she started crying. And she started telling me the whole story. Global Family also takes on rape victim cases in South Delhi. They have cared for these girls with such outstanding results that the Child Welfare Council assigns these cases exclusively to Global Family. This is why the authorities have asked us to expand. We're building additional rooms to take in up to 25 girls at a time. Our goal is to help restore daughters to their families as quickly as possible. Some are with us for just a few days, while other cases take longer to resolve. About 95% of girls return to their homes. For those who are unable to go back to their families, we find long-term family care for them. Each daughter is given a special bracelet when she leaves the shelter with our phone number inscribed inside should she ever need help again. It also serves to remind her of how precious she is. How matters. The danger that millions of girls face around the world is a reality. It matters how we address this atrocity. These girls may have been abducted, sold, sexually or physically abused, but at the end of the day, they are somebody's daughter, somebody's little girl who just wants to be held to paint her fingernails, to be a child. That little girl, that daughter, is what this is all about. We don't rescue her to keep her. We rescue her to free her and restore her identity as a daughter. Home with her parents, where she can go to school, play, and dream. The kind of life every child deserves. Thank you for being a part of the daughter project. Um, let's 
two things about this morning that are, um, I think are kind of cool. For one, I guess you've had um, some interesting things above the door as you've had some funky movies played in here, or what, maybe they're not funky, but the titles are funky. And um, so this morning it says about time. <laughs> so I think that's great. That's really appropriate. Um, thanks for having me. And I have been here before. Um, but yeah, it's about time to do something, isn't it? Um, for all of us, I think. Um, and then as well that you had this uh, baby dedication this morning, um, because in reality the whole basis of the daughter project is um, is that little girl. Um, and the whole reason that I became so passionate about this work is because I have a daughter, um, and so I think that's super appropriate to have such a beautiful little girl dedicated this morning. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but let me back up just a little bit. Um, before we started the Daughter Project, how we got involved in this, because this is part of your mission's focus. Um, and my husband and I were both called to India to be missionaries uh, from a very young age before we met. Um, both of us were around 14 when we felt um, called to missions and to the country of India. Um, and so when we met, we met at Southern California College in Vanguard, um, way down in Orange County. Um, I was 18, he was 22, and he had already been to India, I had not, um, but from our very first conversation, uh, the focus uh, was India. Uh, he was basically looking for a wife who would go there with him, and that was kind of how we got started. And so really our whole lives were in preparation to go there. Um, we had our children um, in Bakersfield, California, and then we left in 1999 to move to North India, um, and lived about 8,000 feet up. I don't know how much Charity's told you about where she grew up and all that, but anyways, we lived in the foothills of the Himalayas, about 8,000 feet up, um, and that's where she and her brother were raised. Um, and it was during that time, um, my husband and another missionary would go um, North India, if you know much about that part of the world, it remains the least reached area of the world. You have a very strong, obviously, all the Hindus from the south. You have the Muslim, is, um, Muslim influence and the Buddhist influence. Um, so it's a very, very spiritually dark area of the world. So they would, um, these two guys, my husband and this other guy, would trek into remote areas and um, start churches, uh, take the gospel, take literature, kind of whatever it took. If they were a pastor, they, they would go and try to encourage him because it's a very difficult place to have a ministry, to be a Christian. Um, so there was just a lot of travel, a lot of trekking into these areas. Um, and on one of those particular trips, they uh, went, and visited, um, went and visited the highest village in the world where people live year-round. Um, so it's way up by the Tibetan border, so a lot of Buddhist people living there in that region. And they trekked up to this village um, with all this light of lost literature in their backpacks to give to people, and there were six houses up there. I think it was about 14,000 feet. Um, and they stayed over there um, for a few days. The people invited them in. There was no hotel or phone or you know anything like that and um, they stayed with uh, a family slept above the yaks and everything it was very um, very national geographic ish and um, on the way back from that trek um, the people asked him if he would take a boy with them um, a family who had come over from tibet had sold their son to the village to be a slave which is pretty common um, but they didn't want him anymore he was getting into trouble and stealing things and all that and so they asked um, Clark to take him with them. And you know, you're literally on top of the world. This boy had nowhere else to go, uh, didn't know his full name, didn't know where he'd come from, didn't really even know his date of birth. And so of course they said, yes, you know, yes, we'll take you. Um, and that really started the work of Global Family, which is the name of the organization um, that we started because we do take in children, so we have to get license for our shelters and things like that. Um, but that boy became the start of what we do because we realized there was a there was a, a gap in how people take care of children there in that part of the world. There are a lot of children that are abandoned or they're sold um, or they're orphaned by their parents. Um, but traditionally, they go into institutions, into large children's homes or orphanages, and they become one of a number. You know, maybe one of ninety children in a in a home, and you can't possibly get the attention that every child deserves to have if you're you know number eighty nine. You know. Um, and so we realized that there was there was a need to start a more family care approach through our churches. We have um, we have churches there. We have parents. We have caregivers. Some who maybe can't have their own child, or maybe they raise their own but still want to help other children. And so that's why we started the organization. So 
Eight years after living in India, we crossed the border into Nepal. Um, and if you know the geogra geography of that part of the world, Nepal is a tiny little country kind of sandwiched in between India and it wraps itself around India and China. Um, and Charity at that time was 13. Um, and we had seen, uh, we had been to brothel areas in India and seen um, the issue of sex trafficking and seen, um, you know, these women who had been um, forced to be in these brothel areas for years and used over and over again. And um, we always felt very compelled by it, but didn't feel compelled to, to work in the brothel areas or, or to do that kind of ministry. Um, but when we crossed over into Nepal, it became very clear um, almost all of the girls, over 80% of the women who end up in brothels in India are Nepalis because they take them as young girls and they take them over the border. The border is extremely fluid, so you can walk across um, with no paperwork or anything. Um, and so girls get taken by the thousands every year. Um, and they're taken to the different metro cities of India and they're forced to stay in these brothels or to do domestic slave type labor, depending on their appearance. Um, and so the average age at that time, now it's, it's getting progressively younger, um, but at that age it was like nine to 16 years old and our own daughter was 13. And uh, for us, it just became a very quick decision. We wanna be a part of a prevention. Uh, we've, you know, if it's our daughter, we don't ever want her to get taken, we don't want her to cross the border, we don't want her to even be in a brothel for one second, you know, why, why would we want that? Um, and so we started the Daughter Project, and our primary focus of that is prevention. We work a lot in Nepal and now in Myanmar to educate people, to do um, media campaigns, to do awareness campaigns in villages. Uh, we have children's clubs that work in school to watch when their friends stop coming to school. If a girl starts to stay home, why is she doing that? And they go visit. We have women's groups who um, who uh, loan each other money to um, to create business and finance for the family so they can protect their girls and keep them in school. All different kinds of programs targeted at that girl. Um, Charity didn't mention, but she's interned for us a few times and hopefully will again. Um, and created um, we created a whole girls club curriculum that actually educates the girl herself to make good decisions because we're finding more and more that it's not just the trafficker who steals the girl or the or the parents who sell their daughter, but some girls are actually making choices to go um, and to go to a brothel because, um, not because it sounds so glamorous, but because there's nothing else for her. You know, if she, um, if she lives in a family of maybe six or seven or eight children and they're very poor and she can't go to school and she knows that she's a burden to her family um, that you know someday she'll have to get married and maybe her brother eats more than she does or he gets to go to the doctor and she doesn't um, she's tempted to go somewhere else and she's tempted to make that decision to go um, and so we feel like we need to get to the heart of that and really educate girls so that's the preventative of, um, aspect of the daughter project what you saw in the video was one of the shelters that we have as much as we want to protect those girls and not have them go there, um, some girls do obviously get in harm's way, and that particular shelter is in the city of Delhi, and we work directly with the authorities. We are licensed um, with the Hindu government, um, who knows that we are a faith-based um, group. Now, Global Family is a non-religious nonprofit, but we work in partnership with churches, um, and they have given us so much grace um, in terms of the shelter, asked us to expand. So just last year, we just opened that whole new level. Um, and they bring us all of the rape cases and uh, trafficking cases in South Delhi and have now asked us to open up new shelters. So that's been an extremely, um, uh, I guess, a miracle. You know, who would think um, that, the, um, that the legal system and the authorities in a country like India would be so favorable with, um, with this work. But um, so that's what was presented there. Um, so that's kind of the gist. I wanted to give you a little bit of background in terms of why we got started in this. It wasn't just a hand-picked issue to try and do something about trafficking um, that really came out of a desire to, um, to protect children and preserve families um, as we served on the mission field. So, Charity, you're going to come up and facilitate questions, I think. Um, and we, I'd really love it if you ask questions, so please do that. Because I try to give an overview, but it's, it's better if you can kind of ask me what you're wondering or think about. So. Yeah, so uh, we just wanted to open up this time for you guys to ask whatever you're, you've been thinking about. And do you have questions about the trafficking issue or what the whole family does or how we're going to be partnering with them even? Um, yeah. Oh, we can't really see.
see you, so if you just want to like oh, yeah. blurt it out. <laughs> where do we get all our help to do the projects that we do. Um, so we have uh, we have staff in India, in Nepal, and now in Myanmar. Um, so we have a core staff that obviously we, you know, we rely upon heavily. Um, some are paid, but a lot of those are volunteer actually on the ground, uh, both as caregivers, as people who run our programs in the slums and refugee areas, and then in the shelters. Um, but we do, um, we really, really do, being a small to medium organization, um, encourage people to come from this part of the world and either help us on this side in terms of getting the word out and, and those kinds of things, and coming overseas to serve. Um, because we are you know, still um, a fairly small, you, um, we really do put people to work. It's not like a tourist kind of trip. Um, and we, um, and we, you know, we give you projects that, um, that we need you know, to get our jobs done. So. That being said, the Great world question. is very reliant on volunteers. Yeah, we are. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'd rather have more funds go, you know, to um, to the children and that. And we're really strict about our designations that daughter project funds all go to daughter project and not to administration. Yeah. And so, uh, for the volunteers, is that you won't prefer male or female? Oh, yeah. Um, um, if I mean, we have lots of projects. In terms of working in a shelter, we're obviously extremely careful. Anybody who comes overseas, we do background checks and all those kinds of things. Um, working directly in our shelters, um, more females. Um, but depending on the situation and, and what the job was going to be, we can use guys even in our shelters. But we have other programs as well um, that, yeah, you know, male and female is great. Mm -hmm. But usually it's always girls who volunteer. I know we have so many, I don't know. Like about nine, nine and a half out of ten are always are always female. So yes, we'd like guys to come. <laughs> yeah. Why is it necessary to be recognized as a non-religious organization in such a um, Because um, India, for example, is uh, extremely Hindu. So if we're registered um, with a Christian license in the country. Um, we just put ourselves more at risk of not being able to operate in that situation. Um, that said, uh, we so we are global family as a 501c3 here in the U.S. We're we're registered as a religious non as a non-religious nonprofit, um, but all of our partnerships are with churches there, and that's been made very clear, and they're extremely accepting of it. I mean, you know, on the surface, India is a, um, a religiously free country. But in reality, it's it's not. I mean, it, you know, Christians face a lot of persecution in that, um, and so in terms of like licensing um, and all that, it just makes a lot more sense to be a non-religious nonprofit. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, those are really great questions. <laughs> Any more? So we work in communities. Um, so part of what we do in, in terms of the shelter is, is an activity that really aims directly at protecting that girl and caring for her, obviously, and restoring her to her family. That's what the shelter does as soon as possible. Um, but we have other programs in areas where we where we'll look at a community. So it might be a slum community, an unauthorized kind of transient community, refugee camp. And go in there and try and really try to work with the family as a whole. And normally that um, equates to doing an education program, an informal education program. So we do all kinds of things. Um, you know, a lot of the kids in those areas may have maybe they went to school for a few years and then had to drop out because they have to work, or maybe they've never been to school. So we try to bring kids up to speed with with education and try to kind of bring them up to maybe their grade level so that they can then be transferred into formal education. So, oh yeah, so no, we definitely have other programs, yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how you went from the idea or the vision you had to the organization, um, and also like making partnerships and scaling and things like that? Okay, so repeat the first part. Sure, a little more about how you went from the idea you had, either with the Daughter Project oh, or okay. with Global Family in general, to yeah. like the actual organization. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, no, we, we certainly didn't set out to start an organization. Uh, we went as missionaries with the assemblies, um, and um, actually when we got to India, we were uh, highly encouraged to not do compassion-type work, um, that we just needed to focus on church planning and that in North India because the church is so sparse. Um, so it was uh, was never in our mindset to do this. Um, when, when that first little boy came into our lives, we actually... Uh, with another couple, started a boys' home. Um, And we weren't really instrumental past, you know, knowing, um, like, past the beginning of it and just knowing that that boy needed, you know, a place. He needed, you know, it needed to be education. He needed to go to school and be cared for. And then that became um, the the missionaries in that area anyways and the the local community kind of took that and created this very large boys' home. And it was through that... um, Reality. We went to go visit him after some time, and he was um, he was almost uh, one of 50 boys in that home. There was actually a church that was led in in that um, building, and so we would go there often. And we just um, we were really disappointed at the results. You know, it started off as you know just a few, and it seemed like a, a really great thing. And then all of a sudden, he was one of so many boys, and we just felt really compelled that um, what if that had been our son? You know, what if we had been able to take care of our own son, or we'd had to sell him, or or we passed away, it's not what we would have wanted for him. So we approached several church leaders in our area, um, in North India. Um, You're kind of a part of the network, um, AG and non-AG, and talked to them about the idea of family care. Um, Because we, you know, if we can't take care of our own child, we'd want another Christian family or, you know, people who believed in Jesus to raise our child. And ultimately, that's the next best thing. So we talked with them and... And once we had a few of them that said, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, it wasn't that easy. You know, I mean, at first it was very much, oh, well, there's always a children's home or there's always an orphanage. But, you know, through, I guess, a few years of discussion, just, you know, kind of kept going back and saying, yeah, but we just really don't feel like that's the right thing. And then and then finally kind of breaking through and we had a handful of churches that said, you know, we're on board with this, um, and we have families in our churches that may want to be trained to be caregivers in that. And so then we took it to the next step. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have any restrictions on sharing the gospel with the girls that you rescue? Yeah, we do. Um, so we cannot proselytize. So in the shelters, for example, now in our community projects, um, we're always, again, working through churches. So the churches are already have outreach in their communities, so that's a different thing. With the shelter in particular, um, you know, we may have a girl for three days. We may have a girl for three, four months, depending on the situation. Um, so all of our caregivers, except for one staff that the licensing um, committee requires us to have in terms of a counselor, um, are all believers. Um, and so we share the love of Christ. We cannot um, like try to coerce them to be converted and that kind of thing. But a very similar situation to, and like our caregivers are all believers through the church. So kind of like our families, the way our kids grow up, you know, we're not going to make them, you know, right. at a certain age, you know, you're a Christian now, but we're, we hope that through our example that they would be. So, right. yeah, so that's, that in terms of the shelter, that's as far as we can go. Um, and I have to tell you that um, I was there just a couple months ago. My husband's there right now. Um, it's a very, um, we added another level, so that made me a little bit nervous because now it's 25 beds, but, you know, like I said, the girls are, you know, some are here for a little bit, some are here for a little bit longer. Um, it's a very family atmosphere. Um, there's a lot of love in that place. And the, the one lady who came to us actually um, has a Hindu background. She was the one from the licensing committee. And um, and I wouldn't be surprised if she's a believer now. She's one of the most beautiful people I've ever met. So, yeah, it's it's been um, one of the little girls um, whose dad um, almost beat her to death. She had been uh, found in a forest with um, several layers of stitches needed. He had, he had pounded her head with a hammer, and they had thrown her body away, but she wasn't dead. Um, and she's been in the shelter the longest because it's very tricky now to place her. The, the mother was killed by the father, and he was just kind of on a rage. Um, and she's become um, like a little missionary in the shelter. 
So um, when a new girl comes in, she tells our, um, like the lady that you saw interviewed there, Aradna, the counselor, she goes to her and she says, okay, now I need to welcome this girl and I need to share Jesus with her. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really kind of neat. So yeah, so he works that out. Yes, he does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Fabulous questions. <laughs> And we do have opportunities to get involved. Should we talk about that? Or you can. Um, we have. You can come see me after. It's okay during the connect time, or um, I'll be out there because we are looking for volunteers to help us on this side of the world and also to come overseas. So, if you are interested, uh, that would be fabulous. Yeah. All right. Great. So uh, let's just close in prayer. Uh, feel free to talk to her afterwards. Uh, she's a very friendly person. Um, yeah, so we're really excited to. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, which is great. Um, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to share this ministry with 360 Church. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, in the next year, in 2014, that uh, we would become just so much more aware of these issues that. Uh, the impact that we have with this organization will be um, so profound and just so um, above what we expected. Um, yeah, we pray blessing over um, Jennifer <laughs> as she uh, as she travels uh, more and uh, just continues uh, listening to you and uh, guiding this organization. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>